I'm, I'm delighted that she could take time to join us back here in DC. She has been on the DC circuit, I think now we saw you in February, you were back here once before, and now you're back here to join us and we're, we're grateful. So I've known Julie since I was a commissioner, which tells you how long ago we met, which was a long time ago. Um, and we have worked on energy issues across the value chain since then, participated in many organizations together like NARUC, but also the New Mexico State University Advisory Board. And Julie's got a get it done attitude that I'm sure you will walk away from this conversation um, fully understanding. As I like to say in the most complimentary way possible, Julie is a workhorse and not a show horse. When that's why I asked her to join us for the conversation today. So I'm gonna join you on the chair now since I've done all the things you need to know about Julie. So thanks again for joining. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. Really um, appreciate the invite. You did a great job putting together a really different but excellent NARUC meeting uh, last month in February. For those that aren't aware, we're in the gas committee room. This is where the gas committee always seems to meet, so I should have just put that on the list of places that we should have had you come to. That would have made it easier to find the room, perhaps. Um, so you put reliability and resource adequacy front and center, and I know we've talked about this a lot, but for those that haven't heard you talk about it, why do you think that's so important, and why is it one of the focuses that you've put together for your year as a leader at, as NARUC's president? Sure. Thank you. Sure. And first of all, thank you for of the course. invitation to be here. Really appreciate it. One of the things I definitely appreciate uh, now as NARUC president is the collaboration with different organizations. Was at INGA this um, uh, in January, was down in Galveston with NGSA last month. A few weeks ago, I can't remember exactly, <laughs> and now here with sure. you guys. And I hope that continues beyond, even if a, the next neighbor commissioner, which, well, she'll, Trisha Pryor will probably be similar in theme. Mm -hmm. But just even despite what the themes and focuses are, I think we need to continue uh, our conversations because we're all so integrated. Agreed. Um, so why did I pick reliability and really affordability? Uh, so I've been on the commission in my state for 12 years. And throughout that entire time span, and North Dakota is an all of the above state. We don't just say it, we do it. <laughs> we mm -hmm. have uh, coal, several coal generating facilities still. We have a very large oil and gas industry, and we have a significant amount of wind development in our state. Um, we don't have nuclear yet. Um, we're working on that. Uh, and, and so, I come to this uh, world with that attitude that all of these resources are valid, they all can work, and we need to be fair and approach them all at the same time and, and together. Uh, I've saw early on in my time, you know, the, the change in the approach to this, uh, the, the generation mix mm -hmm. and the aggressive kind of decarbonization push. And I'm uh, our state's liaison to MISO, so I've been in the markets for eight straight years seeing the declining capacity, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Right. Uh, the, and I'm passionate about consumers, uh, because in North Dakota we are elected, and so I'm very in touch with the people who are getting the services from the utilities that I regulate. And those folks have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. They go, they turn their lights on, they have their heaters, they have, you know, their everything's working and they don't have any clue what's happening mm -hmm. on the broader scale. And when you have organizations like NERC, who is the third party, who is responsible for looking at this and saying, you know, hey guys, there's problems here. And it's not just in a few states, it's in two thirds of the country, mm -hmm. two thirds, yeah. the United States of America is in, in jeopardy of not having enough power to meet demand given conditions. You know, it's just not acceptable. Right. In our country, we have the most amazing energy resources of any place in the world. And the idea that we would run short for our citizens who are counting on this, it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. We're committing energy suicide, mm -hmm. and we can't do that. We just have to, and it isn't a mad matter of like, we can't do this at all, or you know, it's like you're anti-decarbonization, you're avoiding the climate crisis, it's none of that. It's all about pace. Mm -hmm. So you, you've opened a lot of topics of conversation. <laughs> so I told you she was a workhorse. Um, so we've talked a little bit, um, and I know that uh, Chairman Thompson mentioned your effort at GEAR, um, mm -hmm. and I always 
forget all of the acronyms, so that's why I call it GEAR, and I don't try to be too smart for my own good. But you've put a different structure together for that because you're trying to solve a problem that Jim Robb has been mentioning for some time. We've got a whole panel on it later today because it's a critically important issue. As I noted in my opening comments, it's not unique to restructured or vertically integrated parts of the country. It's happening in broad swaths of the country. And you said, I want to take the issue on, and we want to try to talk through what some of the issues are. And I'm sure all of you have listened to Julie and I's podcast, the Energy Solutions podcast that we do at EPSA. Uh, Julie was our guest last month. I'm sure you all know that. But in an <laughs> unlikely event that you haven't listened yet, and it's still in your uh, queue, why don't you talk a little bit about gear? And then once you've kind of filled us in on what gear is, I'm curious to know now that there's been an in-person meeting or two, how you feel things are going? Have people rolled up their sleeves? Or are we all still having the polite conversations and nobody's saying the hard stuff yet? Or are you happy with where we are and where do you see it going over the balance of the year? Sure. So gear stands for gas electric alignment for reliability. Gear. Got it. Got to get it in gear. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, and uh, so the group is, is uh, seven state regulators, seven industry folks. There's one, now I, I'm on the spot here and I didn't write these down, I always forget them, but there's two pipelines, one interstate in Texas and one intrastate, um, or intrastate in Texas, interstate between Texas. There's a um, gas utility, there's an electric utility rep, there is uh, a competitive um, marketer rep, there are, there's an RTO rep, and then a, maybe a competitive generator. That's maybe? the competitive. Oh, producer. Yeah. Yeah. So there's seven industries, seven yeah. states. And, um, and they've been meeting since December, January. And the goal was to take all the reports that have been produced. I mean, this, this is a problem mm -hmm. that's been analyzed a lot. We kind of know what the problems are. But finding the solutions is really difficult. Like mm -hmm. Jim said, if it was easy, it would already be done. Right. Um, and so the most recent report was the NASB report, and that was a year-long effort, and a lot of folks in this room, I'm sure, participated in that. Um, I also did, and, and as painful <laughs> as those meetings were, um, they did put together a, a pretty solid report of recommendations. So GEAR is taking those recommendations, your mm -hmm. group's recommendations, what did you call the yourself? Reliability Alliance. Reliability Alliance. That was another great um, effort. And... Storm Urey and um, Elliot reports from FERC, taking all of those various things and talking through them behind closed doors with all these folks who are supposed to represent their industry as a whole, not just their mm -hmm. business. Um, and they've been meeting, they were, they're working twice as hard because they had initially thought they'd meet once a month. They're meeting twice a month. Perfect. Uh, they've doubled down on how many, they were gonna do them all remote, now they're meeting in person. Um, so I, I'm really encouraged by that by the fact that they all see the potential, they all recognize it's hard, we've mm -hmm. got to meet more, we have to be in person because we can be more productive. And so I'm optimistic that they will come out with solutions um, and, and recommendations. That's what they're gonna be, recommendations. I know for sure they'll come up with a strong set of recommendations for states, state commissions mm -hmm. to consider. And um, you know, beyond that, I hope they have other recommendations too, perhaps some recommendations for the temporal s solution that you guys right. talked about this morning, uh, something that can work you know, when you have a disaster evolving. But <clears throat> the truth of the matter is everybody has a role to play in this, the states, the RTOs, uh, the ind industry, FERC, everyone does. And, you know, there's still a little bit of finger pointing going like, no, you know, we don't think we should do it. And I was a little disappointed. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know if they're still here. The RTO paper that they submitted kind of after the fact. I was a little disappointed by that one because I felt like it sort of started pointing the finger away. Like, no, it's not up to us. It's a, and it most certainly is partly an RTO um, uh, issue. I, I think there's a number of things that the RTOs can and must do, and we can talk about that later. Yeah. But it isn't just the RTOs either. It's the right. states, it's FERC, it's industry, it's the utilities. Everyone has to give on this in order to make this all work. And so hopefully those are the things they'll come up with. Great. So you've kind of led me right into the next piece. So I'll let you put a bow on this gear before we move on to another subject. But what's your best case scenario? What are the takeaways? Is it just a report? Because you and I both know reports end up on shelves and collect dust and aren't particularly helpful. 
or is it a meaningful set of action items that are then take this to your state and implement? And oh, by the way, industry, we've identified these half a dozen things, and this one falls in the competitive generator piece, and this is a pipeline issue. Kind of what, if you're drawing it up and have the best case outcome, what's that look like for you? I, we push them hard and made it clear we don't just want a report, we mm -hmm. want recommendations, yeah. a meaningful set of recommendations. And I've heard some of the things that they've talked about, you know, very much a give and take. Like, yeah. could we take, you know, a piece here and a piece here and end up in the middle? Would that be a solution? Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's really exciting to me that they're getting that kind of granular and ho yep. hopefully we'll come up with those sorts of recommendations that can be actionable. Great. We're moving up on the um, we are optimistic scale as opposed to Yay. some of our earlier conversations this morning where we were <laughs> kind of on the downside. Of, yes, we're, we're going in the it's green like... as opposed to the red, which is always good. So your focus on this issue I know is born out of concerns about resource adequacy mm -hmm. and reliability. And we've had this conversation and I've heard you say it before. The, the issue about who's responsible because depends on who you ask, everybody's got an opinion, uh, and I know you have a very strong opinion about this, um, and it's not limited to a restructured versus ver vertically integrated. I mean, everybody has a responsibility, and you've very clearly articulated it, so I'll let you say it to this crowd, but can you lay out your concerns about resource adequacy and how you're thinking about state regulators' response to that? Absolutely, and again, so state regulators leading the way, that's the official theme. Yep. And so I feel like, you know, state regulators, back when you may be in your early days of being a regulator, uh, we were kind of like the Maytag repairman. I'm yeah. dating myself. Yeah. Maybe everyone, the younger people in the audience, don't even know what that means. But the Maytag repairman who wasn't busy because Maytags were so Reliable. great. Yeah. Um, so for many, many years, the grid just functioned. And it was, you know, all the resources brought the same kind of attributes to the grid. And there weren't a, a lot of big, controversial, mm -hmm. challenging problems. And so I think state regulators just sort of worked on the economics a lot yeah. and didn't focus so much on the service or the, the reliability pieces. Um, with the transition into new technologies, which is exciting, which is the American way. I mean, this is what we do. We innovate. We come up with new things, new ways to do things. Uh, so that is, um, you know, very encouraging. But it also created this new uncertainty in the grid. And so now today, regulators, while we used to be sort of quiet and simple, now we've got all these challenges and we are responsible for them. I, I think we have one of the most important roles. I think it's a variety of things. First of all, like integrated resource planning. A lot of state commissions say, well, we don't have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, well, you should get it. <laughs> Go ask for it. You need it. You, you, who else is going to tell your utilities what resources they need to pr provide or you know, give the market signals what resources you guys need? Somebody has to be looking out for this. And you have to be engaging with your RTO and telling them. You know, so I, the IRP process um, needs to happen. And states need to get serious about addressing the whole dispatchability issue. That's our job. We have to make sure that the reliability attributes are there so the citizens get what they need. Um, I think states have to speak honestly to policymakers. We are the experts. We're the ones dealing with this every day. We have to be doing it ourselves, and we have to be expecting our utilities to speak the truth mm -hmm. to the policymakers so they know the complications here and the time frame on which some of these um, technologies need to be deployed. We need to get more serious about retirements. Like when you look at the scale, the demand, the increase in demand and load, we should not be retiring resources in this country. They just shouldn't be happening right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else we even begin to meet what we need today, much less the 25 gigawatts in Texas and across the board. I mean, we're even seeing this in my state of North Dakota uh, where you've added some of those data um, loads and. Mm -hmm before, you know, all of a sudden we're like short. Um, so that, and we have to be honest about the costs. I, I think it, my, my uh, consumers in my state have been told, this is gonna save you money. And then they see me in the grocery store and say, well, if this is saving me money, why is my bill going up? And so there's a disconnect here. Mm -hmm. um, we're not giving people the full story of the all-in cost of this, not just the fuel cost savings, 
but the cost of the new generation, the cost of the new transmission, all of the costs together, what's it gonna look like? So we can, so they can make informed decisions. It's not fair for utilities to say, we're doing this because our customers are demanding it, and the customers are demanding it because they're getting half the story. Mm -hmm. So that has to, that divide has to be bridged. And, and, and so th those are the things that I think state regulators are responsible for doing. And the good news, of course, is our members shift that risk off of ratepayers and put it on investors and shareholders as competitive generators, which puts us in a completely different perspective. But I think your issues that you raise about state regulators not just throwing up their hands and saying, I have no responsibility here is exactly right, regardless of the business model. Absolutely. Because without engagement, you end up at a significant information asymmetry, and that leads to bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so I think on that we would agree universally, and your, your comment about the retirement of resources is funny because that is my next question, <laughs> which is how do you think about the proper alignment of retirement and resource additions? I mean, MISO's got a, an issue just like SPP has mm -hmm. an issue, just like PJM has an issue, and even you know balancing authorities in the Southeast have the same kind of issue with how do we figure out sorting out the appropriate and the um, the most reliable way to have that transition of the, the, the fleet exist. I mean, people here have heard me say it, my staff's tired of hearing me say it, but it's energy expansion, not energy transition. Because, I mean, the numbers that the RTO CEOs mentioned were even larger than I had heard. Mm -hmm. And so the volume and the amount of demand is going to increase. How are you thinking about that, both as a neighbor president, but also in your role as a commissioner in North Dakota? Yeah, so... Uh... I think, you know, again, state regulators, there's two pieces to this retirement issue. I think there's two, maybe three, um, well, probably way more than that. But in my simple mind, there's a couple. Sure. So the state, the state roles, again, gets back to the planning issue. And, and every state has different um, pathways and different goals, right? Mm -hmm. So neighbor pushes, like, we've got to protect states' rights. And I 100% am carrying that message, like, whether you're California or North Dakota or New York, like each state has a different idea for how to do this. So we've got to preserve that. And so each state regulator in your state needs to be looking at the requirements under the law, making sure that they're, mm -hmm. you know, achievable and maintain you can maintain the reliability through them and then helping direct the resources in your state to those directions, providing the signals, like we talked mm -hmm. about earlier, for the attributes that you need. Um, on the state level or, or you know, through the IRP process, um, doing that yourselves. So that's the state side. The RTOs have a really important role, and I think so many on the states that are part of the RTOs, I think this could get relatively simple. <laughs> That's if, the first time anyone has said that about <laughs> state and RTO interaction, so I'm all okay. ears. Simple and clear, maybe, <laughs> um, maybe not easy, though, yeah. right? So what the RTOs care about is reliability. Mm -hmm. That's their job. Yep. So tell the states, tell your members, what do you, here's what you need. This is what our expectations are. And I think accreditation, which is happening across the board, yep. is a huge, huge piece of this. So figuring out how to accredit resources for the attributes, the reliability attributes that they bring. Um, and then, again, some might say, like, well, we need to value other things. Well, really, the RTO is in charge of reliability, so let's let, let them do that. Mm -hmm. And then the states can figure out how to meet that based on the policy goals, right? So if you're, you know, if you're MISO and you say, you, XL Energy, you need to bring this m mini megawatts of capacity mm -hmm. to meet your um, obligation. And that includes, you know, like the 15% extra and all right. of that. And then XL Energy gets to figure out how they do that. And then MISO says, here's how we're going to credit. Your wind is going to mm -hmm. get this much. Your solar is going to get this much. Your gas, depending on how, what kind of fuel security you have, might get this or might get that. You know, all of those factors are considered in the accreditation appropriately. Mm -hmm. And then you can add up all the megawatts and have enough to cover the need. And everyone can decide if you want to have a, you know, a carbon-free, fully dispatchable, you know, if you want to have 100% carbon-free um, fleet, then you can figure out we need this many batteries, this much wind, this much solar to add it all up, nuclear to get there. Mm -hmm. And you can decide the mix. 
but the RTO says, here's the accreditation we're following and here's your requirements. And see, easy. It's Simple, just a math problem. not easy. Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated <laughs> math problem. And I've already told everyone at least twice I'm not a math guy. So that, but I think you raised the crux of the issue. And it just, it does reinforce your original point about you have to stay engaged as a state regulator. And I know yeah. your colleagues and my former colleagues, most of them do a very good job of remaining engaged and up to speed on what those issues are because no one wants that phone call when the lights go out and you're the one who is going to get the phone call either from your constituents or from the governor's office or somewhere else yeah. saying what happened and why are people in the dark and in the cold. So we, we know what happens when that happens because yeah. it happened in your Yeah. Right? That's a bad Who outcome. lost their jobs? Right. State regulators? Yeah. RTO. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Gone. So yeah, yeah, it is our job, yeah. clearly it is. So you've raised uh, a litany of issues that you're trying to work on that are critically important. If I asked you to boil that down to three things that you think are the core mm -hmm. of reliability and resource adequacy, what would you say those are? Hmm. I think I answered this in the podcast and I don't remember what I said. <laughs> well, it was brilliant, I'm sure. And everyone, of course, would agree having listened to it, but uh, you may so have changed your mind since then. The three things that are key to um, resource adequacy and reliability and yeah. reliability um, so having the uh, capacity resources mm -hmm. available um, I think the infrastructure to serve I think that's a big piece of the yeah. gas electric reliability component mm -hmm. and a big, big piece of the pace so I think that's part of the problem that we're having right now is we we have enough gas in this country to do it but we don't have enough pipes mm -hmm. or storage to get it done when we need it. And, and that doesn't happen overnight. That's not a you know, simple sure. solution. And so we have to get the infrastructure in place to, to support and provide all the resources that we need. Um, and then I think we need the market structures in place to mm -hmm. pro provide the proper signals. Right. You, you mentioned permitting and siting, and so you, you're working on a, another side project that could involve permitting and siting at some point in your future. So I'm curious how you view the, the situation more broadly. I mean, clearly, the discussion all morning has been, we need more, not less. We need all of the above. How do we address that from a permitting and siting perspective? Because that the political guy in the room, and you're, you're a fellow politician having run and elected in your role, the deal seems fairly obvious. But... If you're looking at trying to convince people in Washington to try and address this issue, how, what would your advice be? How do you counsel people you may work with in the future about how they should be thinking about this issue? Because it seems pretty obvious to me, but it, we're, we're not able to get there yeah. because this red team, blue team stuff. Yeah. So compromise is a dirty word. But how would you think about that? Well, the permitting. So in my state, we have permitting authorities. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of experience yeah. in permitting things. Since I've been on the commission, we've permitted $12 billion worth of new energy infrastructure in our state. And that includes a significant uh, number of wind generating facilities, a lot of uh, gas and oil pipelines. Mm -hmm. Um, gas processing facilities and new gas generation. Yep. So kind of across the board. Um, it is challenging. Uh, I think that we do, the, so the first thing I think is like these ideas that the, that the federal government should take over permitting, that is not going to make it go faster. <laughs> like anybody who thinks that the federal government is right. going to do something faster hasn't, hasn't worked, with the, federal worked with the federal government or done <laughs> permitting with them. Sure. In our state, it's taken them 10 years to get a mine permit mm. for a coal mine. 10 years. Yeah. Can you imagine having that delay as a company? Right. So, um, so that is, that's not, I mean, that's an easy solution. The only way that the federal government could do it faster, I think, is if they just decided like, well, we're just going to dictate where everything goes and just do it. Mm -hmm. Um, again, big concerns with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, private property rights are the foundation of this country. It's one of the staples, and we cannot give that up. Yeah. So uh, I think having states involved, and but you know, the permitting reform on the federal level with some of the federal agencies, I think, is where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, at for starters, you have to, and, and maybe provide some judicial reform so that the, the lawsuits can't go on indefinitely, right. have some timelines on that. And then it should apply to everything. You, if you, we need more transmission, like electric transmission. We need more pipelines. So maybe today, maybe now, because both of those mm -hmm. are uh, needed, and 
uh, both sides can give to, to see benefit for both and, and you can get it done. So I'm hopeful that that's... You would, you would think that's a common sense approach, but <laughs> that's not always in full supply here in Washington. So I want to ask you about the expansion of the FERC Nehru uh, Collaborative, where um, that was just announced, the chairman at FERC announced it at their last open meeting, and I know you're deeply involved in that. So talk a little bit about what you hope that will um, cover and kind of the laundry list of issues maybe that are on the list for consideration, but certainly why this was an important step for FERC and Nehru to take together. Absolutely. So um, we were very excited. The Nehru community was really excited about the, the FERC Nehru Transmission Task Force mm -hmm. uh, that started about two years ago or three. I can't remember how long right. ago. A while ago. Yeah. Uh, and there was a ton of interest by commissioners in participating in that. And the FERC commissioners also really liked it. And so it was like a formal uh, topic-specific uh, collaborative. And so when we were kind of obviously coming to the end of that, mm -hmm. the natural land, they were close to writing their rules on, on mm -hmm. that issue. Um, Chair Phillips and I started talking last November, like, what, what's next? Yeah. And, you know, the other commissioners, FERC commissioners, expressed um, interest in continuing that effort. And so... Uh, Willie and I talked about like what would it look like, how should it be, and I, I pushed hard to have it be sort of one year at a time uh, and having rotating commissioners. You know, the commissioners, some of them want to get on there and stay, sure. but I think it's really important because the uh, commissioner lifespan is not usually 12 years. Uh, correct, you're an outlier. <laughs> I'm very long in the yeah. tooth as a commissioner. <laughs> um, so it's usually more like three or four years. So having uh, times a 12 month period where mm -hmm. commissioners can come on, serve on a single topic that's established by sort of the, the president and the FERC folks and and the um, neighbor commissioners at mm -hmm. the time on an annual basis. They'll meet every uh, every neighbor meeting, collaborate, talk about, you know, the agenda will be set. It'll be, I think, public meetings like it is today. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be a formal gathering uh, on a specific topic uh, and there may or and maybe there there may or may not be recommendations that come on that, and and the topics uh, could be a wide variety of things. Resource adequacy mm -hmm. is probably the biggest one um, right now, but there's a whole list of other issues that could come up. Yeah, this feels like a working group, not a gathering where we talk to each other. But roll up yeah. your sleeves and actually get some things done, which. I, I think ought to be clear so far, and will be clear, I'm sure, all day, that that's kind of where our, our industry is. Mm -hmm. That's certainly where our sector is in trying to achieve a lot of these objectives. And there, yeah. it, there's nothing easy or it would be done. So with that, I'm going to kind of give you the last word if you want to close on any thoughts that you have, things that we as competitive power generators should take away as you think about how we interact with you know our peers or how we're engaged at NARUC, because, of course, you're... Still, mm -hmm. I think you're about halfway through your term as neighborhood president. So Almost. talk to us a little bit about how we can best engage and provide useful information to you and to other commissioners. Because in the end, we have a business to run, but we want to be a useful resource to mm -hmm. the folks that count on us to do what we do so that you don't have to worry about that phone call in the middle of the night. Excellent. Well, uh, first of all, thank you um, for being engaged and, and, and reaching out and, const and continually coming and supporting Nehruk and um, engaging with the members. It is really important. I, I do feel like there's an opportunity, it's like through the GEAR initiative, mm -hmm. uh, for us to do some things voluntarily. I know there's pretty heavy push coming from different, uh, different sources to have more federal regulation mm -hmm. on this. And maybe that'll be part of the outcome. I don't know. But I think bef before that happens, we should do everything we can without it. Like we should do everything, all the low hanging fruit, we should do all of that first. And that just requires a sincere um, engagement mm -hmm. and a willingness to change and give. And you know, we can't just say, no, nope, it's up to the next person. So mm -hmm. I know that the, the gas industry in particular has come to the table through gear very earnestly mm -hmm. and is working on those solutions. And I, I have to tip my hat and say thank you for that. Um, as Jim Robb said this morning, he's always so um, quotable. <laughs> we got to start spitting things out. <laughs> 
That's the yeah. quote of the day. Yep. Uh, Got to start spitting things out. It's true. I mean, we just we can't keep talking and celebrating right. the problems. We have to have to solve them. And so, right. to the extent that we can do that through gear, through um, through through neighbor initiatives, through other things, we through your state commissions, get engaged with your state commissioners. Um, intervene in cases. I personally, as a commissioner, love having interveners. It's very helpful for me to have other people saying things that I'm thinking, mm -hmm. but just my thoughts on the record don't matter as much, right? right? Yeah. So having the reinforcement in the record of decision is really important. So getting engaged is, um, is also a way to help us out and help make sure that we're doing things right. Um, and just speaking the truth, I'm, I, I think Roger and Tom earlier, I, I really appreciated just, you can't, we ha this isn't a matter of, uh, of being against something or, or saying like in denial of the need to address some of the environmental challenges mm -hmm. and, and climate change. It is all about um, doing this in a way that is sustainable truly sustainable, which means it has to be affordable and it has to be reliable, mm -hmm. or it isn't gonna be sustainable and we're gonna be further behind, not ahead. And we have to lead the globe. This is not a US problem, this is a global problem. We're gonna have the best solutions. We're gonna de develop those here. And so we have to be leaders there and the pace really matters. If we lose, if we get overly um, uh, eager and get much further ahead than we already are, we're gonna lose the population because they're gonna, there's gonna be an outage, like the Northeast is, is in very precarious situation. God help us if we would've lost that gas system last year. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody yeah. would be saying, Let, let's meet that 2040 right. timeline if we had lost that gas system. Yeah. We'd be saying, how do we make sure we can do Never this at a pace that is sustainable? And yeah. so we have to, can't lose sight of that. So we have to be willing to speak the truth. Listen, I know it's hard. I've gotten a lot of grief. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a lot of grief I'm for sure. different things that I'm pushing this, but I just keep back to this is not a political issue. It isn't, this is just, this is a fundamental. The government has three things we have to provide for people. We have to provide power, water and food that those are we can't lose sight of those things right. and and state commissioners a lot of them are in charge of power and water mm -hmm. so those are things that we we just have to be shamelessly um uh clear about and and not worry about um ruffling feathers or being you know unpopular we just have to be honest and clear yeah i thought of it when tom and roger were up here and uh, i didn't have a good place to put it in, but your comment raises it. I mean, Mark Twain said, the surest way to fail is to try and please everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that maybe we ought to keep in mind as we're looking forward. So with that, Julie, I will thank you for making the trip again to Washington and joining us. Uh, if you'll join me in thanking Julie Fedorchik for being with us.